strap yourselves in. We're going to cover uh, about 10,000 miles and about 40,000 years in less than an hour. Uh, but but uh, we're here because we do share a common concern about animal welfare. And the capacity to show such interest in others, and particularly other species, is something that is, I think, at least initially, universal among people. I think, uh, as, as the child psychologist G. Stanley Hall once said, to a child, there is no difference between his soul and that of an animal. It cuts across age as well, <laughs> and it cuts across circumstances. We're going to be talking uh, later in the conference about barriers to pet ownership. And I think one of our concerns at the A is trying to overcome those, those, uh, those areas. And often also cuts across species. I think there really is an intrinsic, at least primate, if not even stronger, uh, ability to form <laughs> strong attachments <laughs> to others. So, uh, but the relationship between people and animals isn't always warm and fuzzy, and that's what we're going to be exploring this evening. We're going to cover several thousand years of the connection with a focus on investigation that side of the human-animal interaction that doesn't always go well for the animals. Uh, and we're going to look at the current state of animal cruelty investigation, particularly the growing field of veterinary forensic sciences. We're going to also take a look at how we are using some of those modern investigative techniques to look back thousands of years to better understand animal cruelty that may have taken place long, long ago. Uh, and I'm going to use a very general term for animal cruelty, any act or omission causing unnecessary pain, suffering, or death to an animal. Now, I've you know, written lengthy chapters, thousands of words, trying to define animal cruelty, but that's a good working definition. Uh, and as long as we have been humans, we've had this connection to animals. Uh, it's evident in the earliest, you know, the earliest known human art are these cave paintings. And how we interact with animals is revealed in our art, in our writing, from archaeological, anthropological findings. Uh, this particular cave painting goes back about 40,000 years, depicting an early hunt. Throughout most of human history, uh, and we'll start with prehistory, throughout most of human history, our interactions with animals pretty much fell into two categories that anthropologists and archaeologists have explored. First of all, uh, concerns of man the hunter. You know, when I was learning anthropology, that was sort of the, the, the focus. What are our adaptations to being successful hunters? And uh, one of my professors helped change that view a little bit, uh, Professor Bob Sussman, who talked about man, the hunted. So much of our interaction with, with animals through most of our human history had to deal with uh, real or imagined fears of fighting monsters, trying to work out that relationship between other living creatures. We're going to talk about a lot of uh, that whole concept of fighting monsters, a theme that persists throughout history. Our, our ancestors were very good at being man the hunter or woman the hunter, probably. Uh, and and uh, during, and perhaps we were a little bit too good at that. During the late Pleistocene, uh, about 12,000 years ago, when this area was actually under a glacier, uh, we saw massive extinctions of, of uh, many of the planet's largest mammals. While climate change, disease, and other factors might have been a factor, I think most, most individuals or mo most researchers now really do think that human interaction, human hunting, was the cause of most of the major Pleistocene extinctions, again, about 12,000 years ago. Uh, both North and South America experienced a loss of about three-fourths of all large mammalian species uh, beginning about that time. And just very quickly, the, the, I think there's, we'll see, you know, we see this little animation. The uh, green dots are species that have since gone extinct. The blue dots are the incursion of humans as the glaciers melted, and bit by bit, these species were wiped out. 
uh, including 74% of all the large mammalian species in North America during this small period. Uh, we have no way of knowing whether uh, some prehistoric activist ever asked the question, do we really need all these mammoths? Are we really going to eat all this stuff? Did Og the caveman ever say, you know, guys, why don't we just let that sloth go on its own way? Remarkably, one species of the megafauna was spared this extinction because we found it useful to make friends. Oh, firstly, these are some of the species that we could have found in this general area uh, 12,000 years ago. Various mammoths, rhinos, mastodons, uh, saber-toothed tigers, hyenas, cave lions, giant hippos. All gone. But there was um, one species that was saved. And probably somewhere there was this conversation. This was the turning point in the domestication of the wolf into the dog. Should we eat him, or should we play with him, or should we hunt with him? And in fact, probably the dog was a very useful companion in assisting us in these, in these hunts that went on. Um, such surplus and perhaps, perhaps unnecessary killing persisted well into modern times. I was lecturing a, a little while ago in Saskatchewan, and I visited a, 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 I took a, a trip to a, an interesting site. Uh, an interesting site here. This is not just an interesting, beautiful cliff. Uh, this is one of many sites that were used for over 5,000 years by indigenous people in a process to efficiently drive thousands of buffalo or bison to their deaths, called a buffalo jump. We have buffalo jumps throughout the northern US, throughout southern Canada, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan. And the technique was to, uh, sometimes with the aid of dogs, or uh, to, to drive these animals off the cliff. And again, at some point, perhaps some um, member of the tribe had said, do, guys, do we really need this many buffalo? You know, what, what is actually going on at the bottom of this cliff? I think we're wasting a lot of good bison on this. But uh, we do know that at least one Blackfoot tribesman in Alberta, Canada, several thousand years ago, at least wanted to investigate this form, what I would consider surplus killing or excess killing. And he said, I want to find out what's going on at the bottom. I'm going to check this out. And unfortunately, it didn't work out quite that well. But he does have a site uh, permanently named after him, the Head Smashed In <laughs> Buffalo Jump World Heritage Site, site in, in uh, Calgary, or in Alberta. Now, uh, of course, the, the native, or, or you know, the, the, the first people's hunters uh, were responsible for uh, quite a bit of, I think, surplus killing, but not nearly to the extent that uh, the white man was. This was very different surplus killing for purposes of food and hide or whatever, which is a little different from the surplus killing of buffalo that we saw in the Old West in the 1860s through 1870s. This is a pile of buffalo skulls. Uh, and there, the extirpation of buffalo in that case was partly intended to essentially remove the livelihood of the Native Americans. And these skulls were basically ground into fertilizer. I consider that at least you know, an ecological form of, of cruelty. Now let's take our forensic time machine back a few thousand years, halfway around the world, uh, to the Middle East, uh, beginning at least 750 years uh, BC, to uh, when m most of, of uh, our information about human relationships with, with uh, domestic animals uh, it relates to our relationships with, with cats. And you know, we, we have the, the kind of mythology that the ancient Egyptians revered cats. And certainly they were probably instrumental in the domestication, I think this was in the domestication of, of uh, a, a lot of uh, cats back in those days. We associate uh, ancient Egypt in general with the cult of Bastet, uh, a goddess of, of protection, warfare, and some say the goddess of, of dance and agility. 
dating from about 3000 BC. And most of this view of the Egyptian reverence for cats actually comes from a, a short passage in, in uh, the uh, historian Herodotus from about 400 BC, uh, who is probably accurate in his description of cats in the temples of, of Egypt, but probably not uh, overall. He's, uh, he, he says uh, that, that uh, the cult included harsh penalties for in, injuring or killing cats, and it was illegal to remove a cat from Egypt. And when a man killed one of the sacred animals, if he did it with malice, he's punished with death. You know, cruelty to cats punishable by death it sounds pretty advanced, and I know we run into a lot of people that would like to advocate that. <laughs> uh, if done unwittingly, he pays a fine to the priests. But most of the uh, use of cats and the devotion of cats involve religious practices that were quite different than, I think, uh, we consider our relationship with our domestic pets. That yes, cats were revered, cats were at the altar, but that altar usually included uh, a, a relic, and that relic was a cat mummy. We had the view for many years that these cat mummies that we were finding in the hundreds of thousands, dating back to the 1800s, when the first discoveries came, we thought these were beloved family pets that had been memorialized and mummified and given a place of honor. But I think a more accurate interpretation is these mummies, these cat uh, icons, were a way to get a message to the goddess Bubastis to carry uh, a message of your reverence for this goddess into the, the, the nether world. And if you wanted to earn the good graces of the goddess, you had to make these kinds of offerings. And so we've uncovered, or archaeologists have uncovered, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of cat mummies, often quite fancy, entombed in clay and so on. But only in modern times have we started to look more closely at what's inside these mummies. And uh, often you can find you know, very good remains of those mummies. And, uh, but what you begin seeing with more and more of these is evidence of just who these cats are and how they died. Uh, you might not see it clearly here. I think I've got some clearer pictures. Uh, but this is a young cat. This is a kitten. And can those of you who have had your radiology, can you tell how this cat probably died? Cervical dislocation. These are not beloved family pets that passed away. These are kittens who had their necks broken and then mummified, wrapped up, and basically sold as a relic, relictual offering. Uh, she describes, uh, and we started discovering this back in the 1990s. Contrary to the general belief ancient Egyptians never killed their cats, many of these had broken necks. Cats were being bred to be mummified by priests for sale and votive offerings which could explain what appears to have been a mass market for mummified pets. With the emerging interest of, in Egyptology around the time of the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s, uh, a lot of these areas, a lot of the, 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 the uh, burial sites for these, these relic cats were unearthed. And over 300,000 cat mummies uh, were unearthed from temples of, of Bast in the Nile Delta. Uh, and many of them wound up as ships ballast, uh, going back to England and France, and were later, like the buffalo skulls, turned into, ground into compost. These were not beloved companions who had passed on and been given a royal funeral. Uh, here's a, a clearer picture, again, a little bit more clearly showing the cervical dislocation. Beyond that, there were some other potential crimes associated with this. Uh, there was such a need that sometimes in some of these nice, looking cat mummies, you radiograph them or open them up, and inside it's basically floor sweepings or chicken bones. They're basically selling fake cat mummies. Um, the 300,000 or so cat mummies pales in comparison to relatively recent finds uh, in, in uh, another area of Egypt, in the Saqqara uh, area of Egypt, this was a, what we call the catacombs of Anubis, 
which was dedicated, again, to, to the god of the underworld. Uh, he was represented as a jackal, but, uh, and the Egyptians actually, there's some evidence they tried to domesticate jackals, didn't go well, uh, but they did have a local small wolf, the Canis lupus polypes, the pale-footed wolf, and that, did, that went quite well. Uh, but um, the catacombs of Anubis were first unearthed in 1897, but they only really began being subjected to intensive investigation in the last generation or so. And forensic analysis has really only begun in the last decade. Uh, this is the, an aerial map of, of the catacombs of Anubis. All kinds of sacred animals are entombed there uh, and, and mummified. You, you've, you've got um, baboons, hawks, ibis. But one of the largest uh, and most interesting to me is the dog catacomb. I think I zoom in on the dog catacomb here. Um, yeah, the dog catacomb. And these are a whole series of underground caves and tunnels in which were found eight million dogs. Um, the sprawling site has, as I mentioned, many, many different animals. Uh, but, uh, and there, uh, but and the majority of them, uh, and some of the dog remains were in special areas. This is what it looks like on the inside. All these little side tunnels each had many, many animals. Now, as estimated, the site originally contained as many as 8 million dogs. This would have been the result of entombing 50 dogs a day during the period of use of these catacombs. Uh, clearly producing such a vast quantity of dog bodies required an efficient system of dog breeding and processing. Here we have, just published you know, a couple of years ago, the first evidence of the first puppy mills. There have been no remains found because presumably you know, the cages would have been made of reeds or wood. Uh, they probably you know, were, were fed chickens or, or if fed at all. So we have yet to find, and I would love to talk to more of the archaeologists working these sites to see if we can uncover any remains for these world's first puppy mills. But eight million dogs were eventually entombed in this area. And some were quite elaborate. And these probably were maybe beloved family pets or pets uh, or animals of, of priests. Uh, and some were just kind of loosely wrapped. And some were just kind of cast around. You have all kinds of different kinds of remains. Uh, some of the individuals do show evidence of trauma. This particular animal probably was killed by blunt force trauma, although uh, the speculation is that most of these, again, like the kittens that, the, that were being entombed in, in uh, those catacombs, most were probably puppies or young animals. Uh, the number of pathologies engendered by disease or trauma was quite low, about 5% of the sample. But many of the individuals, death would have been followed swiftly following birth. They f speculate many of these animals probably starved to death soon after birth. They were mummified, wrapped up, and so on. Uh, there were uh, not that many intact enough to really do much forensics. I would love to get Rob and some of our other folks over there. Let's do a field trip to, to Egypt. Uh, <laughs> drowning, poisoning, or early separation from the mother were most likely the causes of death. Eight million dogs stuck in caves in, in Egypt. Well, let's jump to a couple of thousand years into the future to uh, the Roman Empire and the, the Christian era. And we, I think most of you are well acquainted with how animals and people were treated in Roman times. Um, the, the, the institutionalized human and animal abuse in the Roman Colosseum, you know, date, dates back to uh, about 100 years B BC. The inauguration games of the Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum, uh, in 81 AD lasted for 100 days. Uh, over 9,000 wild animals uh, were slaughtered. During just one festival in 240 AD, they uh, were killed 2,000 gladiators, 70 lions, 40 horses, 30 elephants, 30 leopards, 20 wild asses, 19 giraffes, 10 antelopes, 10 hyenas, 10 tigers, one hippopotamus, and one rhinoceros, all for the entertainment 
of the, the folks in, uh, in the Roman games, bread and circuses. This is what the public wanted to see. Um, so many wild beasts were killed in the Colosseum and other Roman uh, uh, arenas that some exotic animals, as during the, the Pleistocene extinctions, uh, became extinct, uh, including the Nile hippopotamus, great auk, European wild horse, oryx, and many others. Now, executions uh, were often uh, involved, you know, pitting uh, the condemned or Christians against wild animals, and usually both wound up dead in one, le one level or one way or another. One of the favorite ways of doing execution one that, that tended to please the populace the most was to have the condemned criminals come out and be stomped on by an elephant. The philosophy, underlying philosophy was they were perpetuating the notion that criminals were less than human, and therefore it was fitting that they be killed by animals. And then usually for entertainment, the animals were killed as, as well. So uh, anybody investigating this? Anybody objecting to this? Well, there was some opposition, mostly uh, a minority view. Uh, the major voice against the, the Roman games was, of, of course, uh, uh, came from Christians. Uh, believers stayed away from the amphitheaters. And a practice was promoted by, by uh, this is Tertullian, was a, a priest. Uh, they allowed Israelites to attend to argue for sparing the life of a fallen gladiator, but uh, they had to avoid watching the games. There was one early cruelty investigator who decided he wanted to try to interrupt these proceedings. And that was Telemachus. He literally jumped into the gladiatorial pit on uh, January 1st, 404 AD, and said, stop this nonsense. What do you think happened? <laughs> the crowd said, boo, boo, kill him. And they did. But the emperor at the time, Honorius, had become a Christian. And he ended the gladiatorial games that year, at least against killing people. The hunting games the display of hunting prowess against wildlife continued for quite a few years after that. Uh, now I'm going to move a few thousand years into the first, uh, in, into the medieval periods, and we, we actually see the first appearance of criminal proceedings involving uh, animals, beginning around 1380. In most cases, though, these criminal proceedings were not against those who hurt animals. They were against animals themselves. Uh, this book is available on online. It is the classic uh, um, by, by E.P. Evans uh, on criminal prosecution and capital punishment of, of, of animals. Uh, usually, these were cases of homicide, uh, often pigs or occasionally other, other animals. Uh, involving, or they involved bestiality cases or ecclesiastical courts, which would prosecute uh, rodents for, invest, for invading fields, insects for devouring crops, things like that, excommunicating beetles. That was a, a popular pastime. Uh, but anyway, I do recommend this book. It's from 1906, but it is available online. It's fascinating. Um, these trials did prof uh, offer, provide an opportunity for the first stirrings of what we now call animal law. Uh, one defense attorney was actually called in to defend a pig that had been accused of, of trampling and, and killing uh, a small child. Uh, there was another case of some rats were being accused of destroying crops. Their defense attorney argued that they could not appear in court because they were afraid of traveling. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, Here's another, I don't know if you can see it. This is uh, an old woodcut called Execution of a Sow. Again, the, the uh, pig being hanged for having been involved in uh, killing uh, a, a child. The defense of animals in court, though, started about the same time. And uh, I, I recommend strongly to you, there was a, a film from 1993 called The Advocate or Hour of the Pig, 
uh, where Colin Firth actually plays a defense attorney for a pig that has been accused of killing a boy. And he actually solves the crime. It actually was a race crime committed against a Jewish child. Uh, uh, a very interesting film and, and historically reasonably accurate. The opening scene is also reasonably accurate. It opens with the presumed execution of a man and a donkey for bestiality. And it was not uncommon if in cases of bestiality in those days to basically pass a death sentence on both the human and the beast. Uh, in the movie, it, it, it works out nicely. Uh, the donkey is pardoned, the man is hung. So good movie, I recommend it. Executing animals, though, for causing deaths of humans uh, is not an ancient, only an ancient and medieval practice. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the case of Topsy in 1903. Topsy was an elephant on display in Luna Park in, in New York. Uh, she killed three people, including one trainer who repeatedly burned her, fed her lit cigars. And she finally had had enough and stomped on him. Uh, so it was decided that uh, she should be destroyed. They uh, proposed feeding her carrots infused with cyanide. That didn't work. Uh, then they said they were going to hang her. And ASPCA came forward and said, that's inhumane. Uh, so who came forward was Thomas Edison. Now Thomas Edison at the time was engaged in a battle with George Westinghouse. You know, Edison had come up with direct current power transmission, which didn't work really well. Westinghouse came up with AC current, which we use today. But Thomas Edison wanted to prove how dangerous direct current was. So he said, I'll kill this elephant for you. And he electrocuted the elephant. The video is online. You can watch it on, on YouTube called Electrocuting an Elephant, the first snuff film, animal snuff film. Uh, Edison actually went around with his associates electrocuting dogs, cats, and others to show how dangerous Westinghouse's plan was. It failed, uh, but, but uh, it, it, I think it's a dark sign. But we still, you know, I, I'm still disturbed having been involved in a lot of serious and fatal dog attack cases. You know, we still have that underlying philosophy. I was involved in the Di Diane Whipple uh, homicide investigation back in 2001. And as is typical, virtually every dog that is involved in a human fatality winds up on, quote, death row. Uh, so there's an almost medieval quality, I think, still to the way we, we treat animals involved in, in this. Well, let's move on to taking uh, animal cruelty seriously. Now, up until fairly recently, up until you know, 200, 250 years ago, if people cared about animal cruelty at all, it was because of the link, the, the idea that somehow being cruel to animals was a sign of bad moral character. Okay, uh, from Thomas Aquinas saying, if any passage of holy writ forbids us for being cruel, it's because they might become cruel to fellow human beings. And one of the best and most influential demonstrations of this, and I think many of you might have uh, heard me speak on this before, the work of uh, my, my favorite artist, William Hogarth. And this is Hogarth with his, with his beloved dog. Um, and back in 1751, he painted a really, uh, or, or drew, a very uh, influential series of woodcuts. Hogarth was the most popular artist. Some people called him the Walt Disney of his era. His paintings and, and woodcuts were so popular, uh, they were so widely ripped off that the first copyright protection laws were actually passed in England called the Hogarth Laws to protect uh, his, his, his work. And some of you are probably familiar with his, his, his series, the, the Four Stages of Cruelty, uh, back in 1751. And in the first stage of cruelty, he depicts what he considered to be a common street scene in England in the 1750s, where all these nasty young boys are throwing a cat out the window, hanging up cats here, uh, getting ready for a cockfight, sicking their dog on a cat. But the center of attention is this boy here, Tom Nero, who is sticking an arrow into the, the anus of, of the dog, tormenting him, while one nice boy is trying to get him to stop. So this is the story of Tom Nero 
and uh, the evolution of his cruelty. So you see all the various forms of cruelty. These are all things that presumably Hogarth had witnessed. So let's focus a little bit on this guy. He is the first documented animal cruelty intervener investigator trying to get him to stop. You know, just here, take this. Stop tormenting this dog. In the next stage, Tom has now grown up, and he's become a carriage horse driver. He is, his horse has a broken leg. He's overloaded it with fat judges. Other scenes of animal cruelty are going on. Uh, but notice, OK, here we have someone is writing it all down, taking good notes about this case of animal cruelty. Who is this guy? Well, who that guy is, is Prince George. And Prince George was one of Hogarth's uh, uh, patrons. And he thought the best thing he could do to portray Prince George in a good light was to characterize him as the first documenter and investigator of animal cruelty cases. Now, we know Prince George a little bit better as uh, King George III or for those of you who are Hamilton fans, King George III. <laughs> uh, but I really like this because it really does demonstrate you know, the, the first uh, attendance, uh, attention to the importance. Well, Tom Nero is captured after he kills his girlfriend. And he has left her pregnant, murdered, and mutilated after she has stolen her mistress's silver for him so they can run off. She writes him a love letter, but this is how he has repaid her. This is also, from a forensic perspective, a fascinating illustration. He has shown, look at this, defensive wounds on her hands as she warded off the blows. The mutilation that we now, having talked to FBI profilers, uh, associate with mutilation we see by sexual homicide perpetrators with an adolescent history of animal cruelty. And I've shared this with some of my friends at the FBI. This is about 100 years before Jack the Ripper. And he got it right. He got everything right in the illustration. That's why he's my favorite artist. <laughs> now, the rewards of cruelty. Uh, he was hanged and then sent to the dissection theater, disemboweled. And his entrails are fed to this aging dog, who you may recognize as the dog that he was abusing uh, as a young boy. So the dog gets the last laugh. But that, and back in 1750, that was setting the stage for finally taking this stuff seriously and investigating animal cruelty. Most people haven't come across this, but because it came out in 1776, when there were lots of other very liberal notions being floated around, I think this is a very important uh, book that, that most students of uh, animal cruelty don't, don't really read uh, by Reverend Humphrey Primat. But it has a key thing that, that I think echoes very much with us today. Pain is pain, whether inflicted on man or beast. The creature who suffers it, whether man or beast, being sensible of the misery, suffers evil. That was a revolutionary concept in 1776, that for man and beast, pain is pain. And I know Lila and I have encountered veterinarians not too long ago who would have even refuted that, refuted that notion, or at least said, I need more evidence. And of course, one of the most famous uh, statements on this uh, from, um, uh, from the, uh, a footnote from Jeremy Bentham you know, the question is not can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? So much of our legislation and other concern deals with suffering. So when do we begin to formalize this? Well, we, form, we start finally getting humane law enforcement back in 1822. So we're talking pretty recent history now. And a person of great interest who's not well known in this country is Richard Martin, Humanity Dick Martin, co-founder of the RSPCA. Uh, Martin was a very wealthy landowner. He was particularly concerned about things that we still are concerned about today. Uh, he was an Irish politician from a wealthy family, long-standing crusader against animal cruelty, 
had particular concerns about livestock transport, bull baiting, cockfighting, dogfighting. Several attempts were made in England between uh, 1809 and, and uh, 18, and, and that area, 1800-1809, to pass some animal cruelty uh, or animal protection legislation. And that's where uh, Dick Martin got, got the, the nickname Humanity, George by, uh, Humanity Dick by uh, George IV. Uh, but because he owned a huge manor in, in Ireland, he was the law. So he had a habit of taking people who had abused their animals, starved their animals, or mistreated their animals, rowing them out to his private island, and sticking them in a jail that had, he had built on this island, and letting them think about what they had done for days or weeks. So he, was, he basically was investigator, judge, jury, and jailer back in uh, the 1800s. In 1822, Martin drafted uh, a bill called the Ill Treatment of Cattle Bill. This was really our, our first uh, sweeping anti-cruelty bill. A law existed, there was no good mechanism for its enforcement. So uh, Martin and some, some folks tried to form a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals in 1822, but got nowhere. And finally, in 1824, he and several lawyers and clergy and members of, of, of uh, Parliament got together in Old Slaughter's Ale House and drew up the, the, the uh, specifics. And uh, they, they passed sweeping animal cruelty legislation uh, under, called the Martin Act and actually was used as one of the most famous cases. It was neglect of a donkey. Martin himself served as prosecutor and got a successful Conviction, And then several years later, uh, Queen Victoria granted the uh, SPCA royal patronage, and that's how it became the royal SPCA. And their inspectors began actively investigating dogfighting and cockfighting when new laws were passed in 1835, making dogfighting, bull baiting, bear baiting illegal. Uh, at least one RSPCA investigator was killed investigating cockfighting back in those days. Started out with a relatively small collection. Uh, this is just a, a bring it a little bit further. This is from 1909. Return of convictions for September 1909. Horses, donkeys, cattle, sheep, goats, dogs, cats, rabbits, fowl, ducks, linnets, and various wild birds, all subject of animal cruelty investigations. Um, the RSPCA for more than 100 years has had the luxury of serving the entire United Kingdom. So they're very good at tracking what's going on. And uh, currently, uh, they have about 150,000 investigations and about 2,000 convictions each year. Now, US was, a, a, was getting active about the same time. Our first state anti-cruelty law was in Maine back in 1821 with a fine of two to five dollars. And since we're here in New York, and New York is the birthplace of the ASPCA, we had an original anti-cruelty law modeled after uh, Martin's Act, uh, again on killing horse, ox, cattle, or sheep, uh, belonging to an, an other, uh, or shall maliciously beat uh, animals, whether belonging to himself or another. That was a revolutionary concept because we used to think, well, animals are property. You can do whatever you want with your property. But beginning in 1829 in New York, uh-uh. Even if it's your own animal, you have an obligation to treat it humanely. Which brings us to our founding of the ASPCA. And like Richard Martin, uh, Henry Berg was very well off from wealthy family, shipbuilding family. Uh, he had traveled throughout Europe, uh, spent a lot of time in England had seen the success of the RSPCA and wondered, you know, could, could we do it here? Um, the, original, the original patrons of the uh, ASPCA included the police board president, who is the equivalent of the, the uh, current police commissioner, and the district attorney of New York County. Berg also succeeded in being, account, uh, being appointed 
as uh, to the New York bar and being given authority to act as a law enforcement uh, uh, official. And ASPCA has the law enforcement authority to investigate and prosecute uh, cases that come under uh, the, our authority and the anti-cruelty statutes that were passed. So over the next 150 years, ASPCA and many other local ASPCAs and humane sites took an increasing role in investigating and prosecuting cruelty. Um, now, and so there's the revised anti-cruelty law uh, that, that deals with abandonment, that deals uh, also with dog fighting and things like that. Animal fighting made illegal, animal transport made illegal. Uh, and this, this was a fairly typical scene. Now, I think our investigators were a little bit better dressed in those days than <laughs> in more modern times. Uh, and I'm very proud of, of this illustration because we can honestly say the ASPCA was engaged in the very first dogfight raid in the world of organized dogfighting. Kit Burns ran a dogfighting and cockfighting operation, uh, and in 1868, uh, ASPCA officers busted him. And I really like this picture too because we didn't just go in, you know, guns blazing or whatever. The animals are being led away, hopefully to safety. Uh, echoes of what we saw much, much later in our work against Michael Vick. But we weren't just limited to that. This is um, a letter from Henry Berg to P.T. Barnum complaining about the cruel method of feeding his snakes in his exhibition. And Barnum and Berg were constant, constantly battling uh, over the maltreatment of animals in the circus, something that has continued uh, until very recent times. Ironically, despite all their, all, or the, all their battles, they became close friends. And actually, in, in Hartford, uh, the P.T. Barnum a uh, museum has a, partly, uh, a section devoted to Henry Berg, and Barnum paid for a statue of Henry Berg that, that is in, in Hartford. So they actually became fairly good friends. Uh, like Richard Martin, who was often made fun of in Parliament and elsewhere, Henry Berg w was constantly ridiculed for his concern for animals. But talking, you know, Lyle will be talking about the links and domestic violence. Here's the arrest and afterwards imprisonment for killing a cat, although provoked by an act of catnip. But this is a domestic violence case where the family cat has been killed and the ASPCA has arrested uh, the individual involved because of the connection between the killing of the cat and the domestic violence. But he was widely lampooned. These days, we sometimes talk about Henry Berg as being the most famous person most people have never heard of. He was a superstar in the 1860s. He was a celebrity. He was a contemporary of Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln appointed him to be a, a, a ambassador to, to Russia for a while. Uh, he was a contemporary of, of Lincoln and Darwin. Now, uh, in the 18... Uh, the, SPC law enforcement continued to grow. This is our law enforcement group in 1905. And now let's move into modern times. People began to take animal cruelty much more seriously as we saw the growth of information on the connection between animal cruelty and interpersonal violence. Uh, and some of this came from you know, the, the, the dramatic case histories of people like Jeffrey Dahmer who went from this kind of interaction to this. And David Berkowitz, son of Sam, uh, who killed a dog, parrot, and many other animals. And one of my buddies, Keith Jesperson, who wrote a lot about uh, all the animals he had killed. I spent a lot of time interviewing Keith Jesperson. Uh, that's from a film I made of him where he had just said, uh, the, the, mo the last person I killed was my fiance after he's killing. Uh, anyway, we, we saw a wealth of publications beginning in the 1980s. Uh, my first book on this, uh, Phil Arco and Frank Ashion's book, one of my students, Linda Merez, uh, Mert, Mert Perez. And more and more literature continuing to come out. And this finally started getting the attention of law enforcement, who started making this, this connection. Just we've seen this real pro proliferation of resources, just in the last 10 years or so. 
One of the consequences of this was that people started, in legislatures and in law enforcement, started finally taking animal cruelty seriously and making it a serious crime. I gave my first lecture on the connection between animal cruelty and interpersonal violence here in, 19, in, in 1984. We had four states with felony animal cruelty. Two years ago, we finally hit every state. And I think um, that really shows the impact that the appreciation and public concern for animal cruelty has managed to have. Uh, also at that time, uh, starting in 2008, ASPCA had you know, Animal Precinct, where our 20 or so uh, animal cruelty investigators were highlighted. Very popular show on, on Animal Planet and soon copied by Animal Cops Detroit, Animal Cops Houston, Miami Animal Police, Animal, Animal Cops San Francisco, Animal Cops Phoenix, Animal Cops South Africa, Philadelphia, Miami. Um, but those of us at the A were always a little concerned. That was, that was our group of investigators for a city of seven or eight million people. Look back to that 1909 picture, we had two, three times as many people back then for a much smaller city. We couldn't do it all. And we finally made the decision, what I've been saying for many, many years, we need to make the investigation of animal cruelty an integral part of policing. Just as domestic violence didn't used to be taken that seriously by police, and now every police agency has all kinds of specialized training in domestic violence and special protocols for responding to domestic violence. We said, we need to bring this to every cop at, at every level. And we started doing that in New York. We did form a partnership then with the NYPD. Uh, now for a couple of years where basically we provide extensive training. ASPCA continues to provide the forensic work thanks to Rob Reisman and his team. Uh, we will do the sheltering, uh, we'll do care. We'll do legal advocacy work. Uh, they do the police work. We've gone from having a response time that sometimes from our officers w might be a day or two before we could get to respond to a case to a guaranteed response time of, of usually under, under an hour. And just as the foundation of ASPCA back in 1866 was dependent on having the equivalent of the police commissioner on board, fortunately, we have our police commissioner uh, and, and uh, all the, the, the major brass uh, really supportive of that. So how about, well, where do you guys come in? Where do the vets come in? Well, um, when ASPC is, was formed, one of the first things we did was start constructing uh, horse ambulances to deal with, uh, with, with all the horses that were down or injured or whatever. Also. Um, about this time, Henry Berg was concerned that, we, that most of the veterinary practice in the 1860s was farriers and fly-by-night amateurs, and there was no real formalized training. And Henry Berg lobbied the New York legislature for establishing a college of veterinary medicine. And James Law was hired, and I think many of you here certainly probably know some of the history of the school, but Henry Berg was very influential in, in the hiring uh, of James Law. Also, uh, Alexander Lutard frequently visited ASPCA and talked with Henry Berg about cruelty cases. And he was the editor of what has now become JAVMA uh, and was a, a, a close friend of Henry Berg. So from the very beginning, ASPCA has recognized the importance of involving veterinarians in preventing animal cruelty. Uh, interesting that Augustine Leotard's his first influential book was Animal Castration, something we still obviously deal with. Uh, a real turning point, I think, in the profession, and one of our personal heroes for Lila and myself and others, is, is Helen Monroe, uh, a Scottish veterinarian uh, who first published an article called Battered Pets uh, back in 1996, patterning it off Henry Kemp's article, The Battered Child, that really created the notion of a syndrome that we could characterize as intentional cruelty to children. And Helen Monroe and her husband, uh, Ronald, 
uh, they're, they're both quite active in the field, this is one of their more recent books, uh, really championed the notion of non-accidental injury and, and the veterinary investigation of animal cruelty. And I think she's a hero to many of us. Um, and since then, you know, AVMA has adopted some guidelines uh, on investigating and uh, that uh, Lila's showed off the, 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 I'm proud to have been part of the first textbook uh, on the topic. And since then, we've seen still a relatively limited number of, of resources on this, but continuing to grow. And most recently, I think many of you uh, might have seen uh, earlier this year, this, the special issue of veterinary pathology with a special, issue, uh, special focus on veterinary forensic pathology. And the formation of the International Veterinary Forensic Science Association, every one of you should become a member. Uh, we just had our 10th annual meeting in New York City in May. Uh, we had about 350 people there. Uh, not quite sure where. Our next one is either going to be in Portland or, I just heard, or Orlando. I'm hoping it's going to be Portland uh, next May. Uh, we have our uh, online program in veterinary forensic sciences through the University of Florida, either a certificate program or a full master's in veterinary forensic sciences. And uh, I'm proud to be an instructor in that, that course. And here's Dr. Rob and his team uh, in New York City that we have working. And then we have Rachel Teru and Dr. Christina Balcom and our uh, crime scene analyst, Amanda Fitch, working out of Gainesville. So we continue to grow our veterinary forensics team. Uh, and we have our specialized vehicles, our rapid responder, and our two crime scene vehicles now. Also, you know, we realize the importance of advancing the field through research. Uh, we've done a lot on scarring patterns involved in dog fighting and how they are characteristic and how we can actually, and we've used this evidence in court, that the kinds of wounds you see in dogs that have been used in dog fighting are different from the wounds you see in dogs that have just happened to get into a fight. And this has been published. So these are some of the recent publications, uh, Jody Gurdon's paper with Rob and some by myself. So we. My particular department, we try to devote our time one-third teaching, one-third research, one-third case response. It tends to be more two-thirds case response and do whatever else we, we can. But we're just beginning to get a lot of this stuff out in the literature so it can stand up in court. Uh, we, we've also funded some other research. We funded a, a student looking at uh, post-mortem interval estimating time of death through the decay of equine RNA, ocular RNA. Uh, we have ongoing research on forensic entomology, essentially creating body farms for animals, looking at, at how that evidence decays. Uh, we have new and continuing concerns that we're focusing on, trying to do more research on uh, animal hoarding, animal sexual assault, livestock, neglect and abuse, and so on. Never say you've seen it all. Um, so, Where's this field going to go? Where are some of the new areas where we think there's room for growth and improvement? Uh, Frank McMillan, I think he's working on a second edition finally for this book. Right now, psychological abuse, which we all know is important, we know our dogs and cats can suffer from psychological neglect and, and other, certainly uh, captive wildlife and, and uh, other exotics can also suffer psychological deficits. But it's not yet recognized in law. Haven't really seen anybody, we don't have a, a legal definition or legal recognition of psychological abuse yet. So we're really just beginning to understand. But clearly, you know, a pit bull puppy that lives like this from the age of eight weeks, that's not a good life. That animal is suffering even if he doesn't have anything physically wrong with him yet. So I think that's one area. Another area we're getting questioned on, the, that, that we really don't know much about, whether it constitutes cruelty or not, is obesity, a hot topic in ve the veterinary world. And I'm often asked, well, is allowing your animal to become morbidly obese, is that a form of cruelty? We have seen some prosecutions in England on that, not in the US. I think given the fact that we have a country where 30% of the population is considered obese, we're not going to see it anytime soon. Um, I mean, we, we, there have been several case histories in child abuse of children that have been allowed to become 
morbidly obese and attempting to prosecute their parents for child abuse. And those have not been successful. Uh, the other area where we're hoping to see more work is what do we do in terms of prevention and treatment? Uh, a new book by Lacey Levitt, Gary Petronik, Tom Grisso, uh, on forensic mental health issues and evaluations. How can we find out more what's going on in the mind of those who hurt animals? Not just the intentional abusers, but the animal hoarders and so on. Then finally, what's the future using new techniques in forensic science? How can we apply these to better benefit animals? Um, we've made use of our canine codis. We take DNA from every fighting dog that we seize. We are often able to link fighters who've had animals. They say, I, I don't know this guy. Well, yeah, but your dog is the, his dog's offspring. Uh, I think you do know him. And we've actually used that in some court cases. Some new areas, uh, and we actually do have a, a DNA laboratory that we fund partially at the University of Florida where we can do some good DNA work now. Uh, and there are new emerging areas in forensic science of touch DNA, most of you hear know, using very, very minute uh, uh, amounts. Also familial DNA, it's being used in human crimes. That we might not have DNA from this suspect, but we've got We've got the DNA from the crime scene, and we've got DNA from his brother or his uncle or whatever, and that can help prove a case. We haven't used familial DNA yet, except in the context of uh, canine codis. Um, some of the other areas, we, we've actually sponsored a few workshops on cadaver dogs for locating uh, buried remains, and new research and new developments going on here. I, I, I like this new device called the Labrador, uh, I think they had to come up with something that would then, then, a description that would fit using the name Labrador. The lightweight analyzer for buried remains and decomposition odor recognition. <laughs> so Oak Ridge has been the, the area that's been doing a lot of trying to come up with something better than the dog knows. Uh, it's not yet, but maybe someday. Uh, we just had training actually at our last IBFA uh, conference on working with trace evidence and even trace evidence on trace evidence. Uh, remains on, on, on a bullet that might have passed through an animal or ricocheted off something. Uh, analysis, better analysis of animal hair. Uh, I'm very interested perhaps in potential applications of microbiomes. Every one of you has a cloud uh, of shed skin, bacteria, and it's unique to you based on what you're eating, what's living inside you. Uh, and they're just beginning to use individualized microbiomes to identify specific individuals or suspects. Uh, and certainly animals and people, we know each have potentially a unique microbiome. I don't know of anybody yet studying animal microbiome evidence, uh, but I think it's potentially a good area. Okay, well, we talked a lot, to sum up, we talked a lot about fighting monsters. That was our original concern in our dealings with animals and animal cruelty trying to find out how to eat or not be eaten. We continue to fight monsters. I think one of the important takeaway messages for those of us who are or want to be investing in animal cruelty is to pay attention to the monsters we continue to fight. Uh, Nietzsche's famous quote, he who fights monsters might take care lest he become a monster. And if you gaze for long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. We do a lot of training for investigators and particularly vet veterinarians. And when you start looking at the victims of animal cruelty, and in my case, dealing with the perpetrators of animal cruelty, you are looking into that abyss. One of the things that makes you a good investigator of animal cruelty is being able to put yourself in the head of the victim. What was going on with this dog, with this cat? Why did it behave? How would it have behaved if this was going on? But also to understand what was going on in the mindset of the perpetrator. Why would someone do this? How could someone do this? And when you gaze into that abyss, the abyss is looking back at you. And we put a lot of emphasis, I think, at, at the A in stepping back from that abyss. And I, I gained an appreciation of that from uh, Rob Ressler is the FBI profiler. He died about two years ago. Uh, but I did have an opportunity to, to uh, deal with him a couple of times. He invented 
or popularized the term serial killer. He had a nervous breakdown, partly for all the time he had spent looking into the abyss. His colleague, John Douglas, who many of you know, he was the consultant on Silence of the Lambs, uh, also famous, very famous profiler. He had a nervous breakdown uh, from the time he spent looking into the abyss. We continue to fight monsters. These are the monsters we fight. This is just last month's monsters. Uh, I'll just go through these quickly. Man charged with animal abuse, shooting girlfriend's donkey, threatened offers family, grandfather, convicted of child porn and bestiality. I mean, I get two or three of these a day coming across my desk. And we don't get involved in all of these, but we certainly have to read about them, learn about them, deal with them. These are the monsters we face. And um, we need to work with each other. We need to help each other. I love this, this, this statue uh, from 1909, looking into the abyss, uh, the two looking into the abyss, supporting each other. We need to be doing that. We need to do that our, our, ourselves. Uh, we need to be able to comfort others who face that abuse and then draw us back. AVMA certainly recognizes this. A lot of, lot of concern these days on wellness and peer assistance. And because we're here as a group, we're here kind of as a, an extended family, I, I hope we can continue to keep that message uh, alive with us and the importance of peer assistance because we talk about compassion fatigue. We, we, we talk about burnout. This is probably the most stressful area of the practice of veterinary medicine. We need to find safe relationships, uh, safe spaces, sources of inner strength, and the peace and cherish of the love of others. Uh, usually, and I, I do have to throw in a picture of my beloved daughter who's found a source of peace. This is uh, practicing uh, stand-up uh, surfboard yoga with dogs. This was, in, this was in Aruba this summer, uh, working as a volunteer with Sgt. Pepper's Friends, an animal rescue group in Aruba uh, that also is very involved in yoga. And she's found a way to deal with you know, animal rescue and the pain and suffering of removing animals from dumps, helping take care of them, finding them good homes, shipping them out, and yet finding some inner peace. So we need to do that as well. We need to find and cherish the love of our colleagues, our friends, our families, and our companion animals. Uh, the animals need you. Uh, you're their heroes, just like this is from the first Band of Mercy, our little hero in the witness box. Um, <laughs> the animals need you. You're their heroes. We are their voices. Persist. Thank you.